Okay, so this is uh, kind of interesting because this will probably, uh, you know, the, we have been using C out and C in all throughout, right? So after this lecture, hopefully you will be able to see what this really is doing. I mean, although we will not go explicitly into what C out is doing, but you will see that this is just a special case of what we are going to study in this lecture. Okay, so. Uh, so to motivate this, you know, think about the class V3 that we have studied and we had declared this member function, we had defined this member function called sum which could take another object of class V3 by reference here and it could add the X, Y and Z components and return you an object of class V3, right. And we had used this in the motion simulator program to do something like UT plus half AT squared, right. But if you look at this, this, I mean, yes, this is indeed doing ut plus half at squared, but it is really a very clumsy way of doing that, you know, invoking, putting dot member function name, dot member function name all over. So it would be really nice if I could do something like this. If I could just write velocity times t plus half of acceleration times t squared, right. But of course, you know, the problem here is the plus that we usually know of is plus on integers or floats or doubles that that really cannot, uh, so, so I am talking of a copy constructor, right. So suppose I have two objects of class my string, call them S1 and S2, two objects of class my string of, call them S1 and S2. And S1, so let us say S1 has two data members, C array and length, C array is a character pointer. So let us say C array is actually pointing to an array of characters which says maybe hello or something, fine. So my string S1 and S1 let us say in, in this part of the code I have made S1 look like this and so length is whatever 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, length is 5, right. And now I say somewhere later that my string S2 is S1. So now I am trying to declare a new object S2. So that new object S2 will also have a C array and it will also have length, right. So I am declaring a new object which means this will be allocated and I am also initializing it along with the declaration. So I am telling you how, what to initialize it with. Please initialize it with whatever this object was. So what will the default constructor do? The default constructor will simply copy the values in these members to these members. So length will become 5, C array is a character pointer pointing here. So this will also now start pointing there, okay. This is what the default constructor will do. What is our constructor going to do? Our constructor will first allocate a new character array. So it will allocate a new character array of size whatever length plus 1, of size length of size 6 and it will set C array to that. So it will set the member C array of the receiver object, right. Here the receiver object is this, this object has been created just now. I am trying to call the copy constructor on this. So it will set C array of S2 to point to the newly allocated array. The length has already been initialized to 5 through the initialization list. And then if C array is not null for i is 0, i less than length, it will copy C array 0 is source dot C array 0. So it will copy this whole thing over here. Right, I don't know, maybe the length should be 6 here. or maybe it should be copied up to the plus 1. Yeah, so I think it should have been i less than or equal to length. So it, it should copy, it allocates of size length plus 1 and then it copies everything including the backslash 0. So is it clear what the difference is? Clear? Clear to everybody? Okay. So here we want to uh, write, 
code using just plus and star, but of course we can't do that because plus and star as we know work only on integers or floats or doubles. So what we have to do in order to use plus and star to do vector addition, scalar multiplication, all of that uh, is we have to overload their meaning so that plus can now also operate on objects of class V3 and C++ actually provides a way of doing this. So here is how you do it. So plus is a special case of an operator. So in general, let us say I want to, so this at symbol is kind of like a placeholder for an operator. You could use plus, minus, less than whatever you want. Okay. So if I want a particular operator, let us say plus to act on objects of let us say class V3. So this is not explicitly done by the C++ language, plus only operates on integers or floats or doubles in the C++ language. But if I want to define plus, so in place of at, suppose I write plus. So if I want to write, if I want to have plus operate on objects of, you know, the, the non-primitive types, then I can do that by defining a member function called operator plus. In general, if it is whatever that operator symbol is, you can put that here. So this operator is a C++ keyword and if you put plus at the end of it, you are actually defining the operator plus to now act on, to do things beyond what it does normally on primitive data types, right? So if, if you recall at the very beginning of the course, we said that when you write names of functions in C++, you cannot use plus minus all of these, right? These, you can use underscore letters, numbers and all of that. But here is an example of a member function where I can use plus, but just before that you have to have operators. You can't say my operator plus, that it won't accept. Okay, operator is a keyword, so operator plus is indeed the name of a member function, but it is used to redefine or overload the meaning of the, op of the plus operator acting on something else beyond the primitive data types. Is this clear? So, you know, when in our program we write something like C out less than less than something. So, C out is actually an object of some class and less than less than is an operator defined on that class. Okay, so, this is really saying, this is like doing A plus B, so C out less than less than something. And we will see, you know, what it does. But is this clear? So, if I want to define x plus y, I should define a member function operator plus, which should be the receiver object x and it should take y as a parameter. So, this order that first x, then at, then y should also be the same as the order here, first x, then at, then y, except that this at is really a member function called operator at being invoked on the receiver object x with the parameter y. Is this clear? Right? So, if I define a member function called operator plus for the class V3 and in that definition, so if I do something like this, the member function operator plus or in the class V3 and this member function takes as parameter another object of class V3, then it is like saying I have defined operator plus for the class V3 and it can take another object of class V3 as parameter, then I can write x plus y. Right? So essentially what is going to happen is whenever you write x plus y, the compiler will first translate it into x dot operator plus y and operator plus is a member function defined in the class V3 which is the class of the receiver object and then it knows exactly what to do. It will do whatever you specify over here right? and similarly for operator star. So in fact if you see these are exactly the sum operator that we had, the sum member function that we had defined earlier, I have just changed the name sum to operator plus because I wanted to do exactly what sum was doing, but I want to use the plus thing now, right? And similarly, this is the exactly the same as the scale operator. And uh, of course, you know, when I am doing x plus y, I do not want that operation to change the value of y. So I do not want the argument here to be changed. So I have used const there and I do not want the receiver object also to change, right? When I say x plus y, 
and it translates to x dot operator plus y. I want to actually get a new object which is the vector sum of x and y. I don't want either y to be changed or x to be changed. So how do I specify that y should not be changed? The argument should not be changed. I specify by putting const here in the argument. How do I specify that the, the receiver object x also should not be changed? By specifying const here immediately before the function definition starts, the opening brace. Okay? And now I can write something like this because this effectively now gets translated to well dot operator star with parameter t. And now I know what to do. Operator star with parameter t, we know what to do. Right? And similarly, this is acceleration dot operator star t star t. So this star is of course, this t star t, this star is the usual multiplication on double objects. Right? Whereas this is the operator star, this accelerator star t star t is the operator star which is a member function of the class V3. Right? But now if you think about it and of course this plus will be whatever vector is being returned by this call operator plus on that with this side as the argument and so on. But now if you th think about this, here there is a problem, right? Because 0.5 star an object of class V3 should ideally be represented as 0.5 dot operator star and then the object of class V3, right? That's what we have been saying x star y should be x dot operator star y. So 0.5 star something should be 0.5 dot operator star something, but 0.5 is just a double constant. So it doesn't make sense to say 0.5 dot operator star. So in fact, if you run the code like this, a compiler will complain saying it doesn't know what to do with that star. Of course, you could put acceleration star t star t star 0.5. That would be fine. Right? Because then acceleration star t star t would return an object of class V3 and then you can call operator star on that with 0.5 as parameter. But if you want to put it here, then you can't use that member function. But what you can use is what are called non-member functions which also overload operators. So you can define operator star just like any other function in your program. It's not a member of any class. It's not a member function of any class. So this is the function operator star which takes two arguments. The first argument is a double, the second argument is an object of class V3 and then it returns you an object of class V3, right? So this order of arguments is important because I wanted to do 0.5 star something. So the first thing was double, the second thing was object of class V3. So the first parameter here should be double, the second parameter should be an object of class V3 and then I can do whatever inside. And here, as you can see, I've sort of cheated inside and inside I'm just doing, so basically I was trying to implement factor star B. So I defined this operator which takes first argument factor, second argument B, and then I'm returning B star factor. But when I do B star factor, B is an object of class V3 in which there is a member function operator star. So this is going to get evaluated as B dot operator star factor, right? And of course, I, I was able to do here because it commutes when I, a scalar times a vector is the same as the vector times the scalar. But if your operation is non-commutative, you have to do something else, right? So now we can uh, write this code and then these two stars are really the member function operator star in the class V3, whereas this star is the non-member function operator star, not belonging to any class. But of course, internally it is invoking the member function operator star of the class V3. Right? But that is just for this specific case. Okay, so now what kind of operators can be overloaded? Pretty much all that you can think of. And here you see the less than, less than, and greater than, greater than are also there. Right? So C out really is an object of a particular class. And in that class, less than, less than is an overloaded operator. And so when you write C out less than, less than something, less than, less than something, you know, whenever we talk about operators, we also have to talk about their precedence and associativity and all of that. And we had seen precedence associativity of these operators, which you can, of course, override using parenthesis and all of this. So when you overload an operator, its precedence associativity, nothing changes. It's just the, the way that operator is going to be evaluated changes, nothing else, right? So this less than, less than operator is actually left to right associative. 
so when i say c out less than less than i less than less than j so c out less than less than i is first evaluated it basically calls operator less than less than which is a member function of the class of which c out is an object using the next parameter and then what that member function returns is c out itself and it has a side effect printing out the value of i on the screen so it prints the value of i on the screen as a side effect but returns so essentially what i am saying is if i do it like this this is left to right associative so first this gets evaluated which means c out dot operator less than less than with parameter i this function gets called that function has a side effect that it prints the value of i on the screen and that function returns c out itself so now when you are trying to evaluate this you first evaluate this it returns c out as a side effect it prints i on the screen but since it returns c out now again c out less than less than j has to be evaluated again you call operator less than less than on the receiver object c out passing j as parameter as a side effect it prints j on the screen and it again returns c out so that is how you can put this chain of less than less thans and actually get away it's just it's just an overloaded operator of the io stream class which of which c out is an object right and similarly for c in i mean it's it's exactly the same thing the operator is defined in the other way okay all right uh, and then as a special interesting example you can also redefine i mean remember we, we had talked about assignment as an operator right this is pre mid sem we had talked about assignment for example we could write this expression x equals y and z assign that this is a perfectly legitimate c++ statement what it does is this is an assignment expression this is the assignment operator it evaluates to the value of the right hand side which is y as a side effect it copies the value of y to x and then this is another assignment expression this is an assignment statement in which this is copied to z but it also returns a value which is the right hand side whatever it evaluated to but as a side effect it copies the value of the right hand side to z right so here the value of y is copied to x and it is returned from this expression that value is copied to z and it's again returned from the assignment expression so the equal to sign is actually used as an assignment operator to build assignment expressions we have already seen this earlier and so if you could overload operators can't we overload the equals also and it turns out that you can so that is called the assignment overloading and it's just like what you would expect so if i say lhs is assigned rhs just like what we have seen so far like plus star this actually calls lhs operator equals rhs okay it will call a member function called operator equals and whatever that member function does that will happen so one might ask what is the difference of this overloaded assign operator operator equals and the copy constructor the copy constructor was also used to copy one object to another object right and if you recall we said that there are three instances where copy constructors are invoked initialization and declaration passing values to function parameter passing by value and returning of a value from a function those are the places where you wanted to create an object and immediately initialize it with something and assignment is not one of those in fact none of those are assignments an assignment happens when you have something like this this is an assignment statement so the overloaded assignment operator is going to get invoked here right the copy constructor gets invoked there they are two completely different member functions okay the default copy constructor copies the value of all data members on the right hand side to the data members on the left hand side the default assignment operator copies data members from the right hand side to the data members of the left hand side so the default are the same but they are called in two completely different contexts so there is no confusion about when the operator equals will be called and when the copy constructor is going to be called is that clear right so and of course you know whenever you have an assignment expression it must return a value because an assignment is an operator which creates an expression a copy constructor doesn't return a value constructors don't even have return types right a copy constructor never returns a value it creates an object and immediately initializes it with something but an assignment operator will be used to build assignment expressions and they must have values 
So that is the other difference that the operator equal must return a value like all assignment expressions. And what kind of value should it return? It should return a value of the same type as the two arguments, right? Typically it returns the value of the right hand side. But inside your overloaded equals operator, you can make it return something else also. So for example, here is a simple example where we have the operator equals for a particular class which has some private data members. And then you know you're doing something here. So you're accessing the data members of the argument that is passed. So this is just like a copy constructor, right? I mean, as I said, LHS assigned RHS will be LHS dot operator equals RHS. So I must take as argument an object of the same class and this member function will be invoked on an object of the same class. So this member function is going to be invoked on object of class that takes as argument another object of class Q passed by reference. And so, so this part looks just like a copy constructor but of course it's called in a completely different context. So here I'm just copying the data members of the parameter that is passed to the corresponding data members of the uh, of the receiver object and then in a loop I'm copying something over here and finally I'm returning something. So this is a crucial difference from copy constructor. Copy constructor doesn't return anything. It doesn't even have a return type. No constructors have return types, right? But an assignment operator must return something because it's going to be used to build an expression, right? It's like saying I want to write x plus y but I don't want this to evaluate to a value. That doesn't make sense. So this is also an operator which gives rise to an expression and an expression must have a value or type. So this must also have a value and type. So if this is the same as x dot operator equal to y, then this function when invoked must return a value of the same type as the type of x. So that is what we are doing here. We are returning star this. What is this? This, this, I mean, this thing called this is actually a pointer to the receiver object. So in any member function, so this is a, key, this is a reserved uh, keyword in C++ and in the definition of any class in any member function, whenever you use this, it's actually a pointer to the receiver object. Any member function is always invoked on a receiver object. So this is a pointer to the receiver object. So here what am I doing? I am returning star this which means I am returning the receiver object itself. Which means you know if I do something like this, I am returning the object x itself, a reference to the object x itself. This is the receiver object and if operator equal to is going to return star this, then I am returning star of a pointer to the receiver object which means a reference to the receiver object. So, so that's the difference between a copy constructor and an overloaded assignment operator. So up to here is the uh, portion for your ensign up to what we just taught, learnt now. Okay, so thank you for attending the course.